Bar Shalom. All right. um, Becky and Nathan are back. We're very happy. Um, I'll th- I'm going to tell you how righteous the blisses are. Um, as you know, and we, we've been, you're, you're righteous. You don't even know how righteous you are. So, so, so here's the deal. We've been following um, your ongoing competition with Bob Dylan. Okay. Um, and so if, for those of you who haven't, haven't heard, they, they were, the Blisses were on t- tour with their group Barnaby Bright. And um, so I think it was in Charlotte. Okay, so in Charlotte, um, they were at some venue where um, Bob Dylan was also playing. And <clears throat> I believe it was, the concert was happening at the same time. It was happening at the same time. Okay, so, so, um, so I asked Nathan, I asked Nathan, um, so how did it go? I mean, and you know what Nathan said? And I'm sure you would have said, I heard it was a great concert. He's 82 years old. Um, he has a great band. Um, so you moved away from being in competition with Bob Dylan. There was never a competition. <laughs> yeah, but, but see, see, you don't want us to think so because of your righteousness. No, it's just the truth. Okay, okay. <laughs> I like the story that I'm telling, and I'm going to stick with it, okay? But we're glad to have you back. Yeah. Friends, how do, how do we fit in? And I'm not speaking about fitting into our clothes after we gained weight. Um, how do we fit in socially? You know, if you're in middle school and you switch schools, and it's lunch hour in the cafeteria, and you have your tray, where do you sit? I was talking about that with a confirmation class, and one, one young lady um, in our confirmation class said that she's part of some group that's supposed to raise ethical consciousness among the students, didn't quite get the entire thing. So I said, how does that apply? She said, someone came in, and we welcomed them to sit down. And I said, okay, you help them fit in. You, you know, you come to synagogue for the first time. Where do you sit? With whom do we speak? What happens at the owning Shabbat? It's quite awkward. Where do we fit in? So being Jewish in America has always been about fitting in, about being accepted. And we, over time, have done this very successfully. For example, in you look at the Ivy League schools, for example. In the 1960s, Yale University had this incredible, and they did, someone wrote a book about this, had a, a, an informal, but un- underneath not such an informal, admissions policy saying no more than 10% of the, of the school could be Jewish. Now it's about 15 to 20% in, in the Ivy Leagues. Um, look at the acquisition of language in, for Jews in America. The first generation of immigrants, they spoke Yiddish. The second generation of immigrants, they spoke English and Yiddish. The third generation, the grandchildren of the immigrants, a little bit of Yiddish. And the fourth generation is, what's Yiddish? And I had that experience with our confirmation class also, who are really fifth, sixth generation, fifth generation. We Jews have worked hard to fit in. And there are today very few limitations to what Jews can do in America. We are not excluded in business, medicine, law, high tech, private clubs, certainly in the arts and Hollywood. We are the elite. And even with anti-Semitism, which I'm not discounting in any way, our place in the United States is still very accepted and we're very strong. But for many of us, and, I, and I'm including myself, we've taken basically the assimilationist approach. That is, let us contract our Judaism in order to fit in, not to be too Jewish. Not to deny our Judaism, certainly, but trying not to stand out too much. And I'm not criticizing, I'm just stating the obvious, and again, I'm speaking as much about myself as anyone else. For example, my grandfather felt so uncomfortable when I would wear a kippah in public. And he was a proud Jew, and he was one of the founders of the conservative synagogue, and his name was Abraham Goldstein, not not an Irish name, but don't be too Jewish. Another example, you know, 
there are people who really want to have a kosher meal, but on an airplane, they don't order it because they don't want to be. Who wants the, who has the kosher meal? They scream down. People don't want to say, you know, I, I need to leave early, it's Friday night. Certainly people in public life have taken this approach. For example, like movie stars Bernard Schwartz, who turned into Tony Curtis, or to Kirk Douglas, who read it, was ready to confess his Jewishness only in old age. Jews in public life have often soft-pedaled their Jewishness. And so the, the nine US senators who are Jewish being Jewish is incidental, not definitive, and I would think twice about hiring Bernie Sanders to teach in our Sunday school. But there's another way to fit in. Affirm who you are unapologetically. Be accepted because of your own self-respect, by your own self-assertion, which leads others to respect you because of your own sense of self-love and, and pride. And that's why I want to talk about Joe Lieberman tonight, who died on Wednesday. He's one of the most important figures in the history of 20th century American Judaism. And critically important role model, even for us Reformed Jews. And I'm not putting him up that his Judaism is the only way to be Jewish. So let's factor that out. Let's, but let's look at him who he was in his own terms, and what he represented to himself into the world. He was an observant Jew. He said he was not an Orthodox Jew, but he certainly wasn't an ethnic Jew, or a marginal Jew, or I will fit, I will fit in at any cost Jew. He would not compromise who he was. He kept kosher, he kept Shabbat, he prayed daily with tefillin, and I remember when Joe Lieberman was running for, for vice president, and some Jews at the time expressed all kinds of worry. It's not good for the Jews. It's dangerous for the Jews. Their fear said more about their own Jewishness than Lieberman's and his acceptance in American society. I saw his nomination at the time so differently. I remember speaking about, I think um, it was the year 2000, so I was um, a rabbi in, in Central Florida, in Orlando, Florida, but I remember speaking about it. When Vice President Al Gore chose Senator Joe Lieberman to be his running mate in 2000 election, it was an incredible moment. He was a proud Zionist, a Shabbat observing Jew. Senator Lieberman was the first Jew to appear on a presidential ticket from a major party. With no compromise to his Judaism, he would not even campaign on the Sabbath. Just think about that. And a lot to say about Al Gore, so I'm not gonna talk about Al Gore, but the stories about how Al Gore honored his Judaism is, should be a book in and of itself. Despite his grueling workload, Lieberman was always careful to avoid driving, riding, and turning lights on on the Sabbath. When he was nominated for the Connecticut Attorney General, he skipped the nominating committee meeting, which was held on Friday night. And wherever there was an important vote in the Senate, Lieberman would stay late to vote, but was careful to do so without using the Senate's electronic voting system. And after the votes, Lieberman would walk the four, the four and a half mile back to his apartment in Georgetown neighborhood of Washington, D.C., rather than allowing himself to be driven on the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. Now, here's an interesting thing. Um, in 2011, and I, I, I need not to order more books. I mean, so I, I can't, don't ever use the word Amazon in front of me because it's, you really shouldn't do that if you, if you love me. But, it turns out, and I didn't know this, that he wrote a book in 2011 called The Gift of Rest, describing how he observes the Sabbath. Now, I want it so badly, but I will not order it. <laughs> if someone orders it for me and gives it to me as a present, I will accept it. <laughs> so this is, what he, this is what he wrote in a book. It's so, it's so neat. It says, it's Friday night, raining one of those torrential downpours that we get in Washington, D.C. And I'm walking from the Capitol to my home in Georgetown, getting absolutely soaked. 
A U this is so, this is such a good story of the greatness of our country. A United States Capitol policeman is at my side as we make our way up Pennsylvania Avenue from the Capitol building towards our distant goal, a four and a half mile, mile walk. Before leaving my Senate office, I have changed into sneakers, but now they are full of water. And as we sh slosh forward, a Capitol Police car travels along for extra security at a stately pace, but I do not indeed, I cannot accept a ride in the car. Now, I'm not claiming that how Joe Lieberman observed Judaism is the only way. But how he lived his Judaism with such conviction should inspire each of us. What was he saying? I fit into an America, as an American Jew, not by trying to fit in, by living my convictions. In 2000, Al Gore and Joe Lieberman won a half a million more votes than the American presidential election than their opponents, George W. Bush and Dick Cheney. They didn't lose because Lieberman was a Jew. They, did, they lost because the Supreme Court decided that they weren't going to win the election. We have to remember that. This Jewish vice presidential candidate got 500,000 more votes than George Bush and Dick Cheney. In a speech at Brigham Young University in October 25, 2011, this is what Lieberman said. My Jewish faith is central to my life. I was raised in a religiously observant family given to me by my parents, informed by my rabbis. My faith has provided me with a foundation, an order, a sense of purpose in my life. It has much to, it has much to do with the way I strive to navigate in a constructive way through every day, both personally and professionally in ways that are large and small. And Lieberman had moral conviction. In 1963 at Yale, he became part of a very large group of northern white students who went to the south, joining in a caravan of more than 65 young people on a 1,300-mile trip from New Haven to Mississippi, where they encouraged black resident, residents to register to vote, all while enduring harassment by white segregationists. And he had the courage of his conviction, September 3, 1998. I think we remember that. Joe Lieberman delivered an extraordinary public condemnation of President Clinton from the floor of the Senate for behavior Lieberman described as immoral, disgraceful, and deserving of public rebuking accountability. Lieberman, a longtime political ally of the president, offered perhaps the most scathing criticism of any Democratic official about the Monica Lewinsky affair and what the, Connecticut, what the Connecticut senator called his intentional and premeditated denials of the affair for seven months. Such, he said, such behavior is not only inappropriate, it is immoral and is harmful. And he said, in Clinton's actions, he said, contradicted the values the president has publicly embraced for the past six years and compromised his moral authority to restore the strength of the American family. And Clinton was asked, I think he was overseas, about Lieberman's remarks on the Senate floor. You know what Clinton said? I've been briefed on them and basically I agree with what he said. <laughs> and he represented the best in Talmudic Judaism. Listen to the other side. Coming to compromises and mutual understandings, imagining, imagine this, he talked to Republicans. Imagine a Democrat talking to Republican. Seeking common ground? And even endorsed John McCain as president. They were friends and colleagues. He didn't make a lot of friends doing that, but he did. I'm not here to anoint Lieberman as a saint. And this, this Senator Lieberman is not the Jewish Messiah. That's an interesting topic on, on, on Good Friday. But in my opinion, he, he was wrong about his support of the Iraqi war, and he was in a pocket of insurance companies in Connecticut and fought against the public option and Affordable Care Act. That wasn't one of his great moments. But regardless, regardless, he's not a saint. He never claimed to be a saint, and he isn't perfect like none of us are. He needs to be honored and, I think, emulated. America needs Jews who are Jews. We don't have to contract. We are, the most respect, we are most respected when we respect our own traditions. 
The melting pot approach to American diversity, where we all, all of us have to give up something to fit in, can lead us to watered down Jewish identity that doesn't have very little beef, has very little beef, or for some of us, very little tofu. Lieberman taught us something so essential about the Jewish future. I mean, really, I, let's think about that. I'm, 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 I'm so serious about this. We Jews are desperately needed as Jews by the Jewish people. And I dare say that it's only as Jews, consciously reflecting the values and ways of an authentic Jewish life, that they are so desperately needed by our country and our world. We are most effective, we are most effective when we embrace who we are. When we contract who we are, we become less, less effective because we're not linked to that which gives us our strength and our authenticity. May Lieberman's legacy to American Jews be, to be that we should live lives broadly and proudly and even provocatively Jewish. Lieberman shows us the more Jewish we are, the more we do for our great country. I don't think we've ever needed more his message of Jewish authenticity and affirmation as we do today. Shabbat Shalom.